Amen. All right, we're going to get into the word. We are going to co-preach today. Actually, we're going to do this for a couple of weeks. Yeah, you're stuck with the two of us this time. I have uh, co-taught and co-preached with a number of different people, and so has Carrie, but we have never preached together. So, dun, uh, dun, dun. Yeah. I would have to say she is the hottest co-preacher oh. I've ever been on stage with. So. And he's the smartest man I know. <laughs> So, um, so you'll notice the differences between the two of us. He's very high tech. He's got this and I'm old. I have to have my paper. I can't do it. I just cannot do it. So, all right. Are you guys ready? Yes. All right. Grab your bulletins. We're going to read the introduction. Lord, we just ask that you would just, um, that your heart would come through here, that this wouldn't just be us talking, but that we would represent you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Have you noticed that society is decaying away at a rapid rate? Morals are not a standard anymore. Kindness is fleeting and being a Christian is no longer a popular thing. The difference between the world now and when I was in school, which is a long time, is shocking. But what is the cause of all this decay? The work of the enemy? The effects of sin? Man running from God? I'm sure that all of those issues are playing a part in the decay of our society. However, I don't think they are the biggest contributor. I believe the biggest contributor to the decay of our society is directly based on us not taking hold of the roles God has created us for and called us to do. The word lays out roles for men, women, Husbands, wives, children, parents, grandparents, and on and on. And we have allowed those roles to be diluted, ignored, and changed. I don't think this is just by coincidence. Rather, this is a premeditated attack by the enemy, and we've fallen right into it. However, what if we change that? What if we called the enemy on his scheme and said no more? What if we turned back to the word and took on the roles God has for us? I think we would see an immediate balance in the church, in our families, in our communities, and our nation. We are going to take the next several weeks to look at roles. The role of a man, the role of a woman, the role of marriage, and the role of family. When we take hold of the roles God has for us, we don't only defeat the enemy, but we glorify God. You know, I don't know if you've noticed in our society, but there's, and, and I want to say this over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about roles. Today, we're starting with the role of a man. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about the role of a woman and it's Mother's Day. Uh, and then uh, we're going to go from there to the role of marriage and how that plays its part in the church and community and, and so on and so forth. And then the last part will be the role of family. Um, and I, I really believe that this was provoked by the Lord because there is a decay in roles in our nation. Have you noticed that? Like now, we don't even know the difference between boys and girls. We're that smart uh, that we've gotten to that place. And 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 I'm gonna. I will just be unapologetic from the very beginning. Okay, I. We are going to talk about roles and we're going to talk about what the Word of God says and how it says that God created man and woman and that he created them differently and they fall into specific roles and there should be a mutual love and equality throughout that. That is the real word of God. And it has been distorted by the world and saying there's no difference between man and woman and there's no difference between genders and you can think of whatever you want. And it's been just as distorted by the church. That's right. Women have no place and they shouldn't say anything and man is greater. It's been just as distorted on the other side. And today we're going to take this thing and put it right down the middle of the road. Because that is what the word of God says. And I truly believe, and we see this throughout the word, the enemy has always been jealous of God. Anybody ever read that in the Bible? He's always wanted to be like God. And so he has always tried to change God's creation because he's not like God. He's not a creator. There is no equality between the enemy and God. But the only thing he can do because he's not a creator is change and distort the creation that God has made. 
and he's done it forever. He did it with himself. God made him to be a beautiful angel who brought praise and worship to him. And rebellion came in and he, and he, he, he changed the creation. Then he's come and he's tried to change man and woman from the, from the very beginning. He came in and, and said, no, 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 you can be like God. That was of no importance to man. Did you know that? Did you ever pick up on that? That man didn't want to be like God until the enemy said, hey, you should be like God. Why don't you try and be like him? And he's always tried to distort the creation of God. And he's been very successful in it. And he, it's just going further and further. Anybody notice that? Anybody turn on their TV or watch something on YouTube? It's out of control. And how many of you guys have listened to some of these people who are supposed to be brilliant and you go, oh my gosh, you have to be the stupidest person I've ever heard. And here's the thing is, as a church, we try to just not say things and, and, and just love people. Listen, we are called to love people, but we're also supposed to be smart people who actually have a voice. Because in this nation, we actually have that afforded to us. And so we've got to stand up. And it doesn't come by making signs and talking about you're going to burn in hell and all of these things and pointing this judgmental finger. That is not what I'm talking about. But once again, we're talking about another swing of the pendulum where we swing into this soft, nice, ooh, I don't say anything mean. I just love you to Jesus constantly. And I don't want to tell you the truth because you'll figure it out somehow on your own. Bull, that's ridiculous. And on the other side of things, we don't need to be way over here. No, you're going to die and go to hell. Blah, blah. They don't need that either. They need us right in the middle of going, this is right and wrong. This is what the word says. And we do it in love because the last thing we want to see them do is one, go to hell or two, not live the life that God's called them to live in the role that God created them to be in. And these roles are just decaying away in our society, and it has to stop. And it stops by us being loving, knowledgeable, role-taking Christians. Amen? Amen? The decay of our current society started at the beginning of the modern age. I really believe that this was a, a pivotal point for America. You know, before we hit this modern age, dads... Fathers, sons, they were there. They were on their own homesteads, their own property. They were working together. There was generational transfer, hand-in-hand -hand relationship. The family unit was not perfect, but it was sound. And then technology took place, and we started doing a lot of different changes within the modern age. And where did the dads go? They went off to work factories and different things. And, and, and listen, those are good things for us to, you know, I'm not saying it's terrible that we move forward in technology, but, but there became, a, there came a change in the home from this. And what we saw and what you see, as you look back in history, you see dads leaving and going to work. And that's what they had to do to put money on the table or food on the table and bring in money. Uh, but then there's something that has to give in all of that. And it's a role. There, there was a deficit in a role that, that came from that. And it's from there just gone forward and forward and forward. We see it in marital stats. We see that, that uh, divorce just built and got more and more min momentum and just started rolling forward. You know, I was talking with somebody and I said, you know, in the 50s, it was kind of like divorce was happening, but it was still really taboo. And if there was this kind of shame to it, but it just has just continued to roll. And we see in the 70s, throughout the 60s, 70s and 80s, that the divorce rate has just steadily gone up. In 1970, it was 33%. 1975, 48%. 1980, 52%. 1985, it came down a bit. It's down a bit right now. But the, the problem, the decay within society and homes and everything, it always comes back to roles. And we need to know that. And, and we need to understand that God's given us a tool. It's right here. I left mine in my office. Right here. An amazing tool. It's the greatest resource that we could ever ask for. If you need marital advice, it's in the Bible. 
If you need to know who you are, it's in the Bible. If you need parenting advice, it's in the Bible. On and on and on and on. It's self-help book ever. You just can't do it by yourself. <laughs> but it's here. We don't need, and listen, I'm not bashing all the other books. There's good content out there to read. But we should start here. And this talks about roles and stuff. We possess the greatest help tool we could ever ask for, the word of God. If we take the word, absorb it, apply it, and walk it out with the power of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that can shut us down. That's good. So how do we build ourselves and our homes strong? It's on the word. So many of you know, some of you may not know that the red words in the Bible, that's Jesus. Jesus is talking. When you look at Matthew 7, it's in red. It's Jesus. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act to them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. So the word Jesus was the word says, hear my words, build your house on my truth. Amen. And we're living in an age where we have just got facts coming at us faster than we can even digest them. They're everywhere. They're just streaming in at a rapid pace, right? Has anybody noticed? It's just coming from every direction. Sit down. It's coming on the TV. Sit down. Pull up your phone. It's coming through your phone. It's coming at you from every direction. But it's interesting because where... Where are those sources? I mean, some of them are reliable, but we don't always fact check, fact check everything. Everybody's reading blogs for all. I know I could be reading a blog about how to be the greatest mom and it can be written by a sixth grader. I don't know who's writing everything out there. We need to check our sources. And this, my friends, this source we know, this is the living word of God. And we're going to use the word and not the world to show what a man really is today. Okay, but before we do that, we're going to have some fun and we're going to talk about just the differences between men and women. Does that sound fun? Because, you know, what's interesting is as you try and seek this out, it's getting hidden more and more in on the Internet and sources that you can find the physical, emotional and spiritual differences between men and women because we're trying to erase those those differences, but they're there. And actually, for those of you that are married in the room, you might actually walk out of here understanding your spouse a little bit more by the end of this time together. Everybody go, whoa. All right. So let's talk about some physical differences. First of all, let's talk about fat distribution. Great place to start, right? So most men hold their weight within their, their fat between their organs and around their bellies, and most women carry it around their thighs and buttocks. What? No, i <laughs> sorry. Women have better night vision. We can see more colors. We have better peripheral vision and blink more often than men. Constantly blinking. That's caused by estrogen, if you didn't know that, uh, the blinking. Uh, That's so, why we have to have pretty eyelashes. Exactly, beautiful. <laughs> It's like a butterfly constantly just <laughs> flapping in the wind. Men have better depth perception in distance vision and can see better in what and more more of a lighted uh, um, the words there environment. environment. Yeah, women have one hundred and eighty degree peripheral vision. Men are four times more likely to be broadsided in an accident because they didn't see it coming. Yeah, so women watch out. 
<laughs> no, what happens is every time you're driving and there's just the slightest move on the side of you, your wife's like, oh, watch out, right? And it, raise your hand, raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, and you're like, what? I saw it. <laughs> but there is this big difference. It's interesting that God created man and woman difference in the w- different in the way that we see. Guys see long distance. They see way out in front of them. Women see with this great peripheral vision right in front of them. Um, Men are better night drivers because of that long vision. My wife recently uh, lowered the number of deer uh, in our neighborhood uh, in the evening time. He's just telling on me in front of everybody. (laughs) Yes, because see, as a guy, if I was driving and I was going down the road, I would see the deer way before her. Because I see further out. And this is what makes a guy a safer driver at oh. night. Uh, <laughs> oh. It's because you see these things where she's you're, just you're to see it right in, in front dangerous of her. Yes, ground I am. Here. I love you so much. But okay. there are these differences. All right, between I'm us. taking it. Men will look right past something because of their long range vision. So women don't ask a man to go look for something. They did a test and they put butter in the refrigerator on the second shelf in the front. And 48 out of 50 men did not see it when they were asked to go get the butter. (laughs) My boys, I'll I'll be like, hey, can you go get this? And they're like, I can't see it. I walk over there and I'm like, it's right under your nose. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to help you guys out. You ready? If your wife asks you to get something out of the uh, refrigerator, this is what we always do, right? We look down in there. We don't move our eyes. We always move our heads, right? (laughs) And we don't see anything. From now on, go like this. (laughs) (laughs) And you'll find everything, okay? Fix. Hope you have a big kitchen. But God made us in that way really because he made us to be hunters. Uh, it's built into us to see, and it's a, it's a great thing. It's, uh, it's a great thing that God gave us in our role as a man. Uh, God made women to be gatherers. We can see a lot of things that are down in front and around us. Can you see something in this? As we look at these things, it's great to laugh at them and, and we're going to continue on. We're going to look at a few more. But the thing is, is we're trying to erase all of these lines. What if we just appreciated them? What if we just stood next to each other and just went, you know, where I lack, she has it. And where she lacks, I have it. And we just appreciated each other and equality with that, you know, because that is the case. And I absolutely love being a married man with an incredibly anointed woman next to me because she is everything I don't have. And that's a great thing. And and maybe you're in the room, you're like, well, I'm not married and that's fine. Fine. But we, we can't just go, I don't like the saying that there's differences because people have done gross things with those differences in the past. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's just get rid of the stupidness that happens between the genders and roles and all of that stuff and go, I appreciate you for what you bring to the table. And, and, and I appreciate you for what you bring and to I the table. And I appreciate you yeah, for go. what you bring to the table. But she would add a lot more words, right? Go ahead. Women average 20,000 words per day. Men average 7,000. So this is an important thing because a lot of fights happen within this. So guys generally use up all of their words before they get home. And, and, and wife, honey, she's just getting started. Like she's maybe a few. Them. Yeah. <laughs> and so you, you got to just get ready for it, guys. You need to know that there's that difference in us. Men make direct, short statements. It's just what we do. Do you know when we hang out together, women, you might not know this. We just grunt at each other. <laughs> yeah. Football. Mm. Beer. Mm. Yeah. No, I don't do that. But... <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, women often hint towards something. Yes, hallelujah. I, I, I was thinking about this. I'm thinking, you know, sometimes we may have to learn the art of hinting because sometimes our direct statements aren't exactly received. I don't I'm just, just Moving saying. on. So uh, everybody <laughs> take your hand and hold it up like this, right? And then if you're my mom, you turn it in because it's it, it looks different when you look at it from this way. But 
If you're a guy in the room, you will see that mo the majority of the men in the room, your ring finger will be longer than your index finger. Take a look at it. Women, your index finger will be longer than your ring finger. It's, it's not every single case, but for the most part, you'll see that. Interesting, huh? I don't know why. Maybe it's just to point out everything. Is that why women have longer index oh, here? Oh, stop. There's the butter right okay, there. Okay, sleep. <laughs> when a man is in his deepest sleep, 70% of his brain is shut down. When a woman is in her deepest sleep, 90% of her brain is still active. Oh, I hate that. Move on. <laughs> Physical difference is women have two X chromosomes, men have one. That's why men don't identify as many colors. Like they'll go, oh, that's a nice mauve vase. Ma what? What's ma mauve vase? What's a mauve? You need to do some research. There's okay. no mauve vases. <laughs> well, I wouldn't see it even if there was. So <laughs> men have larger organs. We have bigger lungs and hearts and we tend to be more mes uh, uh, muscular in our build. And women on average are smaller in their build than men. Uh, how our brains work is different. Mm -hmm. Men have doors in their brains. <laughs> if they are reading a newspaper, they shut off their hearing. They open a door, go in the room and they close the other door. A woman has doors in her brain and leaves them all open. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every single one. Emotionally, men are fixers. Has anybody ever noticed that? We love to fix everything. We see this all the way to the beginning of the Bible. Man sins, what does Adam do? He runs off and he tries to get some leaves to cover everything up. He's just going to fix it, right? They just run off and they try to fix it. David, he calls in Uriah from the battlefield to try and cover up a pregnancy. And on and on and on. We often will try and fix something that needs to be actually washed because we're just fixers at the base of who we are. Women mix it all together. There's this awesome book. It's actually really hilarious. It's called Men Are Like Waffles and Women Are Like Spaghetti. And you don't even have to read the book to get the picture. So men have all these nice, neat compartments, right? And women, it's all mixed in. The sauce is on everything. It's all touching. Nothing is separated. Amen. Amen. You're grateful. <laughs> Our response to fear tends to be really different. The average male response to fear is a shot of adrenaline in our blood and we take a sense of aggression. The average response from a woman to fear is to actually take a place of refuge, of, of falling back. And, you, and this is a really important one to think and know and understand because when a male is insecure or fearful, they actually don't do the same thing as an average woman of pulling back. They get mad. And that's the way that they respond to fear and insecurity. And I think it's a God-given thing because he has called us per his word to be the protectors of our homes and our family. So his, this trigger within our, our body is, right? And you might see that. You might go, you know, I'll be talking to him and then all of a sudden he's just mad, you know, and he could be feeling insecure or fearful about something. And that's the way we respond, you know, and women tend to to pull back. They tend to to be quiet or, or to to take this pullback role. Now, listen, this isn't in every circumstance. OK, I'm not we're not just making some general thing here, but th these tend to be the, the regulars in those. Guys, it's important for us to see if we see our wife pull back that maybe there's a fear or insecurity that we've triggered there. And we need to look at that response. You know, I was at camp a couple of years ago. I walk out of this building and I see this kid with a rock and he throws a rock at this woman and calls her a couple of choice words. I'm not too soft generally in those circumstances. I grab the kid and I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, that's my mom. And I'm like, what? 
And I said, both of you right here, what is going on? You know, and the kid's like, and I was like, you better shut up and be quiet. And, you know, and he's like, okay, there's an alpha male here. And, <laughs> and he took this nice, ah. Uh, and so I go, what is going on? And she said, well, he, he has eczema and he needs to take a shower. And so I went and found him with his friends. And I said, you got to take your shower and put on your eczema medicine. And he just went ballistic on me. And he started calling me all these names and throwing stuff at me. And I'm like, okay, you go sit over there. Don't move. <laughs> you know, and the little boy goes and sits over there. And I go, mom, you got to understand that when you embarrass your son, when you make him feel insecure, his response is not and cry. Don't do that. And I made it to where I would go and get him and bring him to her so he could do his thing. And then I went and talked with him and I was like, if I ever hear you cuss at your mom or pick up a rock, I'll hit you. So no, I didn't tell him that, but, uh, no. but we had to bring correction to that, but she didn't know that. And often we don't know this and this difference between us and our response to fear and insecurity. It's important for us to know. It is. Spiritually, we're a little different in this area because we've talked about a lot of differences leading up to this, but there's one area where we're all the same. In this room, everyone is wrestling with feelings of failure. Mm -hmm. Every and person in here. Hold on just a minute. Go for it. You go, girl. <gasps> hold on. She's hold got on. more words. <laughs> I do. I do. Um, you know, I think if we're honest, everybody's got this quiet inner monologue. It's not one that it's always real obvious, but everybody's wondering, I, I wonder if I'm failing as a, a dad or I wonder if I'm failing as a mom, wonder if I'm failing as a daughter, as a son, as a friend. And the list goes on and on. And I think the reality is living in a fallen world, we're all kind of left wondering, or am I the only one? No, <laughs> I didn't think so. So as we look at spirituality, and I wanted to say this, you know, I've seen many times uh, in church, uh, we tend to really honor women and smack the tar out of men. And that's not what today is about. You know, generally you come on Mother's Day and it's like, we love you and you guys are so amazing. And then you come on Father's Day and it's like, society's burning because of you and you're terrible, right? And that is not something we're going to do here in any way. Um, but there is, and it's probably because of that response that we see the numbers that Carrie's going to share here. But as we talked about it, Carrie and I talked in, uh, together and I said, you know, the things that a man needs to be able to really open up uh, in any situation situation, especially in accountability, is, is confidentiality that's key. Like that, that somebody's going to keep their mouth shut. They're not going to spread to everybody what's going on. And then compassion, like somebody who, you know, the last thing you want to do is go, you know, I've done this, this, and this. And they go, good golly, you're rotten, <laughs> you know, uh, versus I understand, like, I understand those feelings. I've struggled in these ways and there's, there's this compassion to it. So, so confidentiality is key. Compassion is key. I think some of those have been lacking. Um, but I think that we've also done a lot of hammering on men and a lot of loving on women in the church. Uh, and I think that we, we have to continue to correct that. And it's something that's been huge on my heart, uh, since we've stepped into the lead pastor roles, how do we encourage men to being godly men and not bash them over the head in that? That's right. And so just keep that in mind as I read this. You are not just imagining it. Christianity today is short on men. Here are the facts. The typical U.S. congregation draws an adult crowd that is 61% female and 39% male. This gender gap shows up in all age categories. This Sunday, almost 25% of married church-going women will worship without their husbands. Midweek activities often draw 70 to 80% female participants. Over 70% of the boys who are being raised in church will abandon it during their teens and 20s. Gosh, that number breaks my heart. Many of these boys will never return. More than 90% of American men believe in God, and five out of six call themselves Christians but only one out of six attend church on any given Sunday. Fewer than 10% of U.S. churches are able to establish or maintain 
a vibrant men's ministry. As we look at the statistics, we see, though, that church is good for men. Churchgoers are more likely to be married and express a higher level of satisfaction with life. Church involvement in in the most important predictor of marital is the most important predictor of marital stability and happiness. Uh, religious participation leads men to become more engaged husbands and fathers and teens with religious fathers are more likely to stay, to say they enjoy spending time with their dad and admire him. And men are good for the church. A study from the Hartford Seminary found that the presence of involved men was statistically correlated with church growth, health, and harmony. Meanwhile, a lack of male participation is strongly associated with congregational decline. Men, your presence and your engagement is necessary, and it is so needed. Can I just tell you about trail life on Thursday night? It was The coolest thing I came, Joe had to be here early. So I had to drive Andrew and Zach here separately. And we pulled into the parking lot and it was full and I was going, whoa, okay. So I walked in and this place was buzzing. And let me tell you, the boys were excited. Andrew, he was pumped and he had a whole little group. He invited a friend from preschool And there were dads here. There were grandpas here. There was a gentleman that came that I talked with. And he said, you know, I'm thinking about inviting my neighbor boy because his parents just recently got a divorce and he's looking a little lost. And amen to that. We need that. These boys are hungry. They're hungry. Andrew's been marching around and Joe will say, on my honor. And you have to do the rest for me because I don't know it by heart. What is it? We got any trail men in here? Any trail men? We got a couple. On my honor, I will do my best to serve God and my country, to respect authority, to be a good steward of creation, and to treat others as I want to be treated. That's <gasps> good. <laughs> Andrew says to respect authority. <laughs> but he's, he's on the right track. But it was a beautiful display of... Boys that were wanting it and men that were engaging. And I know that my father-in-law came to Joe and he said, we got to, we got to do surrogate dads. We got to figure out how to do this. And I just want to applaud you men because it was amazing. It was beautiful to see. The effect of man on a society. Let's talk about the different areas that a man brings effect into our world. A godly man is a male who's been given a directive by God to be a leader in his workplace, in his community, in his home. And he is a servant, a reflection of the character of God. When we don't have godly men, what's the effect of that? What is the impact? And I think we're seeing that right now. We're seeing things are getting wonky. Things are getting weird. Things are getting twisted. People are having a hard time. We lose an important role that God created, which is true masculinity. This has nothing to do with being rough and tough, but it has everything with knowing, everything to do with knowing when to be strong and when to be soft. True masculinity is not abusive. It is loving and caring at the core of true masculinity will always be humility and love. That combination needs to be there. That strength, but the core, the drive needs to be love where the worldly man in our society can easily lead when it's beneficial. He might look to be served and that's, contrast to what God is, is telling us to do. And this is not a definitive statement. I'm not marching around going, Oh, all these worldly men, they're failing. No, these guys are awesome. Any of them who are serving their community where we've seen it go wrong is when men aren't operating out of love, right? They redefine masculinity as just being rough and tough. Instead of admitting their faults, they brush past them. 
And the effects of this type of a man can be seen in our society today. We have fatherless children lacking morals and men growing up not knowing what it means to be a real man. Our young men are hungry. In the family, the godly man leads with love. He demonstrates surrender to God, which produces humility. He purposely fills the role of a man in his home. He protects his family. He leads his family. He models a relationship with Jesus to his family. We're not looking for perfect men because they are not existent. Neither are perfect women. In all of this, we need to realize that we are all just very imperfect people. But we need dads who will have a heart after the Lord, who will be guiding their life and lining it up with the word and being responsive to the Holy Spirit, being a humble man. We need men who love their wives as Christ loved the church. So we're going to go to Ephesians 5 really quick. So if you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to go there in Ephesians 5.25. This is actually becoming in this day and age, I don't know if many of you know it, it's becoming a very controversial piece of scripture. And many people are starting to, to say, well, I don't know. I don't know if I really believe that one. It's really inching towards this line that we have where I don't know if that's my truth. The truth of the word has to be our truth. And we're going to talk about women next week. This week, we're going to talk about what it says about husbands. So Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but she, that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ in the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And we see this beautiful picture there. He's saying, husbands, follow me, follow my lead. And what Jesus did is he laid his life down for her. And he did whatever it took to make her ready to be that pure spotless bride, to make us ready, to make the church ready to be the pure, spotless bride that he loves. And it says, love your wife as you love yourself. This is not a harsh mandate. And Joe said, you know, we've seen the world twisting things. We've seen the church twist things. I'm sorry. That is a beautiful passage of scripture. Amen. That scripture is a loving challenge and it's not given by a hypocrite. It's saying, love your wives as Christ did it. Be Christians. Love your wife. Model my love in your home. Amen? A godly man also intentionally disciples his children and wife. If you go further down in Ephesians to chapter six, it says, children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and that you may be, live long on the earth. Number four, fathers do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So dads, we need you to be discipling your children. You are 
the primary discipler. The worldly man can still most definitely operate out of love. We know some great men who don't know Jesus, but the worldly man will never be able to lead his wife and children towards spiritual fulfillment. They just don't have it. If you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you can't lead your family to the Lord. And we'll discuss this subject more as we learn about the role of a marriage. Community, the godly man should be present as leaders. They should be filling voids and they should be serving, not from the position of philanthropy, but from the position of being Christ-like, understanding that their actions have eternal benefits. Amen. So we're going to end um, with just talking about the five characteristics of a godly man. There are all kinds of different characteristics, all kinds of different books written on this. But here's the main point in this. Carrie said this, there's no perfect man. You know, if we just go through a few in the Bible really quick, Adam walked with God, but chose to eat the fruit and sinned against God. Uh, Abraham, he was blessed to be the father of all nations. He, he, he demonstrated faith that was amazing from time to time. And then he really stunk at it sometimes and would lie about who his wife was, give his wife away. Moses was chosen by God. I left out Noah. Noah, I mean, he was righteous, built the ark, all of this stuff. And then he gets drunk off his butt. And his son is cursed because of it, right? Then we have Abraham. Then we have Moses. He's chosen by God. He's going to free God's people. And then he runs off like a sissy into the wilderness the moment things get any rough. And he comes back and he does a great job, but he messed up too. And then you have David who was, as the word says, a man after God's own heart. And he has an affair. Murders somebody. In, in lacks as a father in several different ways captured within the Bible. Solomon, one of his sons, was wise, wiser than any other man, but failed to listen to God's decrees. Constantly took wives when God said, no, don't do that. Peter, he, he was uh, picked by God, uh, and, and then he denies God three times. What's the point in all of this? There's no perfect man. None. And so you can't expect yourself to be that. But I want to read this to you, and we're going to close quickly because we have communion. But Psalm 101 says this, I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord. I will sing praises. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house, house <clears throat> with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part in it. The, the perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with, with what is evil. However, sorry, whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will, miss, will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Even even morning, every, sorry, every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. We are the city of the Lord. And this is a great psalm for us as men to grab and apply to ourselves and just say, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to have evil dwelling in my life. I'm going to be a faithful, faith-driven man. In, in, in all that I do, and if anything comes towards me that is not godly, that is not pure, that is not of good reproach, I'm going to push it away. I'm not going to leave room for it. And then you walk in these characteristics, and there's tons that we can lay out, but let me just lay these out quickly. A, the characteristics that any, any godly man should have is first, he needs to lead. You're called to lead if you're not married, that doesn't make any difference. You're called to lead. There are people in your life that are looking for you to take your place as a leader in their own lives. God created you in that way. You can't stand by on it. He loves. 
It's okay to love and be soft and sensitive. It's all right. It's a good thing for us to look and go, what does my wife need from me? And give that to her in a way that is outside of what we, we find easy because that's real love. Amen. Amen. Yep. We all love to see, you know, the big biker guy pull over and pick up a kitten and put it on the sidewalk because he has every ability to just run by and kick the thing. Right. And you would expect that and be like, oh, that's gross. You know, men are disgusting. But everybody's just like, oh, it's so cute. You know, when the big burly guy does something sweet and sensitive. It's a good thing. It's a good thing for us to have that worked into our lives. A a good characteristic for any godly man is that he learns, that we learn from anybody who's a good, valuable source as a teacher, our kids, other people in in our lives. We need to do that. Finally, uh, the last is, or the last two is that he lasts, that you stay consistent and you push through. And then the last one is that you lay down your life. A real man lives a life of serving others. Let's conclude, and then we're going to uh, do communion. We're running a little over on time. I apologize for that. A godly man has a profound influence on society, his family, and his community. The world, the world does not need perfect men because there is no such thing. We desperately need men who will s- submit their lives to the Lord and align themselves with the truth. As men fulfill their God-ordained roles within society, home, and community, we will see healthy fruit. When we use the Word of God to direct our path and our actions, we automatically become life-giving influences on the world around us. God's ways bring life. Men, you have a powerful part to play in this world. I hope today that you feel encouraged to go out and play it. Amen?